All right, well, welcome and uh, Merry Christmas. I think um, we've got Jeff hiding back there, uh, who's going to give us an encouragement to worship. Today and this week, we are going to celebrate the birth. It's not just a birth. It's the birth. The only birth in the history of the world that results in the marking of time. There's BC before Christ. There's AD Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. It's the birth of the only man in the history of the world to be fully God and fully man. The birth of the only one who was able to live a perfect life so that he could be the propitiation, that he could be the substituting atonement for our sin, our substitute. He took our place. The one. He's the one who, it's the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so we're celebrating that birth today. Y'all don't need to stand up yet because the choir's going to sing. But when it's time, rise and lift your voices in honor of that one. Good morning. We're going to be reading from Luke 2, 1 through 20. If everybody could uh, please stand. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all, that, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Well, we never tire of that story. Um, if you would bow your heads. I was given this this morning, and uh, I was moved. It's a Christmas letter from Jesus as you bow your heads. I'm just going to read it, and then we'll join in prayer. When you look for me at Christmas, you won't need a special star. I'm no longer just in Bethlehem. I'm right here where you are. 
You may not be aware of me amid the celebrations. You'll have to look beyond the stores and all the decorations. But if you take a moment from your list of things to do, to close your eyes and say a prayer, I'm waiting here for you. You're the one I want to be with. You're the reason that I came. And you'll find me in the stillness where I'm whispering your name. Father, uh, we long for that day where we will see you face to face. Lord, as we hear the music, as we hear the song, we realize that we were made to worship you, the one who is holy and blameless, the one on high, the one who will dwell with those who are contrite and lowly of spirit. Lord, we come this morning with that spirit. We come with an understanding of our wretchedness and our, our deep need for a savior. And we ask God that you would come and be near us this morning, that you would be near to us as we hear your word, as we've sung songs of your praise and in adoration, Lord, we come to worship you today and we thank you for this time. We thank you for the, the amazing privilege it is to hear songs of joy and to see the light of the world in people, to see the amazing grace that we have been bestowed upon each day, Lord, as we're reminded today and, and this week as we celebrate Christmas, Lord, that we would give reason for hope uh, with those around us, with families, with our coworkers, with those in our church body, Lord, that we would um, emulate Christ, Lord, that we would be uh, ones full of joy and contentment and uh, solace, Lord, in, in a world that is dark and, and decaying. Lord, we just give you praise for this place. Thank you for this church. Thank you for uh, our homes, Lord, we thank you for our families. We thank you for the amazing gifts that we express each day together. Thank you, God, for our nation. We thank you for the freedoms that we still have, Lord. We ask that you would continue to make us mindful of our freedom in Christ. No one can take that away. No one can take our faith and our convictions and our commitment to you, Lord. Help us to resolve this year as we celebrate, as we look forward to a new year. Help us to resolve to worship you and you alone. Help us to put stock and take stock in you and in your word that we would be resolved in 2022 to uh, proclaim the name of Christ. Lord, there are many that we continue to pray for throughout the week, uh, for our leaders, uh, for our nation's leaders, for our civic leaders, for the police, the fire, for the military, Lord, we lift them all up to you and thank you and praise you for the order that you've given us, for the law, for the rule of law. We give you thanks and ask that you continue to, to bless our nation through that protection. Uh, Lord, we think of uh, Louis Sigmund who uh, whose sister uh, passed away this month. Lord, I, I pray that you would be with him and his grief uh, with the family, that you would continue to comfort and protect. Lord, for Dick and Marilyn, we continue to, uh, to lift them up, that you'd provide wisdom and direction and continued healing there and provision that only you can provide. Thank you, God, for uh, Timothy and Nancy as we have been praying this month as they uh, endeavor to go to Germany that, that you have uh, called them there to uh, explore that area. I pray that you would bless them, uh, that you would give them wisdom and dire direction and discernment. Lord, thank you for bringing them here to, to teach us how to serve. Um, Lord, we have many, many hands that make the work light here. Lord, we give you praise for that. Thank you for Brian Booth, that you'd continue to heal him, and for Amy uh, Haler, that you would continue to bless her with peace and contentment 
in the midst of uh, the trial that she continues with. Lord, today I lift up Jay Olander. I thank you for him. I thank you for his precious spirit. Pray that you'd save his soul. Lord, for uh, Jacqueline being here today, thank you for her and for her family. And thank you, God, that you move men and women to call upon your name one day. Lord, we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Lord, this season reminds us of that day. We thank you that you are our savior. We thank you that you are our king. And uh, this morning as Dave presents the word, we ask God that you would give him boldness, that you would give him uh, resolve as he preaches the word of God. We thank you for this time. In Christ's name, amen. When we speak of the virgin birth, we typically speak of it as that great miracle that God accomplished when Jesus came into the world. And when you think about it, it, it really wasn't a virgin birth. The birth of Jesus was really pretty normal. Yes, Mary was a virgin, don't get me wrong. But the birth itself was, as you heard if you were here Friday night, Mary went through birth pains. She was exhausted by the labor. Her hair, as our speaker said, was matted to her head, undoubtedly. Christ came into this world coated with that chalky vernix and attached to an umbilical cord which linked him to his mother. That had to be cut. The birth of Christ was certainly more significant than any other birth, but the birth of Jesus was actually pretty normal. When we speak of the virgin birth, really what we're talking about is the virgin conception of Christ. That, on the other hand, was unlike any other conception on planet Earth ever. J.I. Packer says this, the supreme mystery with which the gospel confronts us lies not in the Good Friday message of the atonement, nor in the Easter message of the resurrection, but in the Christmas message of the incarnation. It is here in the thing that happened at the first Christmas that the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of Christian revelation lie. The word became flesh. God became man. The divine son became a Jew. The almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wriggle and make noises needing to be fed and changed and taught just like any other child. And there was no illusion or deception in this. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the incarnation, end quote. It is, as I've titled this message, a conception beyond conception. One cannot look to any scientific experiment to validate it. One cannot make any philosophical or rational argument to prove it. One cannot find another example anywhere in human history to justify the doctrine. And having grown up in the church, which I know many of you have, the virgin birth just sort of comes along with the, the, the trappings of Christmas. You've heard it all your life, you've accepted it, and maybe you haven't really thought about it at any great length. It's important to think about. I wonder how it sounds in the ear of an unbeliever that Jesus was born of a virgin. That's inconceivable to mankind, utterly inconceivable. We are reduced 
as we so often are, and I would add so happily are, reduced to the revelation of scripture. We are left to the trustworthiness of the Bible that you hold in your lap. The very words of a God who cannot lie. And I hope you'll come away from the morning understanding that the Bible is crystal clear on this matter. It is not up for grabs, it is not obscure. There's nothing hidden about it in the pages of scripture. The Bible is as clear about the virgin birth of Jesus as it is about his death and resurrection. And you cannot rightly call yourself a Christian if you deny that Jesus was born of a virgin. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States and one of the great founding fathers of our republic, had a very high regard for the man, Jesus Christ. Jefferson loved his morality. Jefferson loved the ethical teaching of Jesus. But he had absolutely no place for the supernatural in the Bible. He was a deist who believed in a God, small g, who sort of created all things, got the ball rolling, and then just kind of got out of the way and left men to do their best. Jefferson, in his later years, I don't know if you knew this, but he took a copy of the Gospels and he took a razor blade and he cut out everything he considered to be impossible or irrational. Jefferson ended up with a Jesus who never turned water to wine, who never walked on the water, who never fed the 5,000, who never raised Lazarus from the dead, who did not rise from the grave himself and ultimately never ascended back to heaven. And you guessed it, Jefferson had a Bible that included no virgin birth. You can still get a copy. It's called The Life and Morals of Jesus, get this, of Nazareth. It's 84 pages. You can pick it up for $4.15 on Amazon. But I would say to you, save your money and buy a pumpkin spice latte. (laughs) In the spring of 1823, Jefferson wrote a letter to John Adams in which he discussed his views concerning Jesus And in this letter, he he predicts the eventual collapse of all belief in the virgin birth. Jefferson wrote to Adams, quote, and the day will come when the mystical generation, and by that he means the virgin conception, of Jesus by the supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classed with fables, but we may hope that the dawn of reason and freedom of thought in these United States will do away with all this artificial scaffolding and restore to us the primitive and genuine doctrines of this most venerated reformer of human errors. That, my friends, is nothing but the idolatry of human reason. Jefferson would have done well to study the depravity of man and the impact of sin upon human reason. When man wants to sit as judge over scripture and thinks that he can somehow determine as Jefferson must have what is in fact genuine and those things that are in fact artificial scaffolding, he has made a great mistake. And there are many in our day who are loud and proud about being all about the science. It's the same argument. As though somehow rational scientific method is able to render infallible truth. If that is your proud bent, my friend, you are going to have trouble as you try and squeeze the God of the universe under your microscope. And you are going to find that the God of heaven cannot be contained in a test tube. 
nor will he be reduced to scientific formula. He is above science, he is beyond science, and science can only rightfully explain what he in fact reveals to science. Men do not discover anything apart from what God wills them to discover. The secret things belong to the Lord. That which has been revealed is for us and for our sons. The scientist who thinks he comes to this thing and somehow of his own power and might uncovers the great mysteries of the universe is simply a proud man or woman. All true science is subject to God. And as Paul writes in Romans, let God be true though every man a liar. And thankfully, Jefferson's prediction of a day where we would finally be set free from belief in the virgin birth has never come and it never will. Beloved, we hold firmly to the virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ if for no other reason than this pure and perfect book teaches it. If God spoke the universe into existence, and he did, it should not be difficult for us, should it, to embrace a miracle in the womb of a virgin. And to reject the virgin birth is to reject the clear teaching of scripture. To reject the virgin birth is to reject the God who gave his word in scripture. And the virgin birth, as we shall see, is one of the foundational pillars upon which our salvation rests and we would do well to embrace it, to believe it, and to proclaim it. This morning I wanna take the opportunity to think through this miracle of Christmas, the giving of the Son of God, and my prayer is really that your convictions as a believer will be strengthened and you'll even understand maybe in a, a greater way the glory and the wonder of it all. Ultimately, that's what this doctrine, where this doctrine, as, as all doctrines, uh, bring us. And that, that is to the worship of God himself, for the wonder of it all. And so I want to take this morning some time to read the testimony of Scripture regarding the virgin birth. And then we want to consider why the virgin birth is of such vital importance. In other words, we want to think about what the Bible teaches, and then we want to consider why that virgin birth matters. Let's begin, actually, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Let's begin here. What, what does the Bible say about the conception of Jesus. The Bible teaches with great clarity that Jesus was conceived in the womb of a virgin mother, Mary, by a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. The Virgin Mary miraculously conceived the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, apart from any contribution at all by a human father. There has never been a birth or a conception like this throughout the history of mankind that, where, where someone was born of a virgin that it did not result uh, uh, from, from some sort of union or contribution. I always have to throw contribution in now that we live in the age of test tube babies. There was no union of man and woman and there was no contribution of male and female seed. In Jesus Christ, we see a child conceived without any contribution of a man. It is a virgin who conceives, a woman who had never known any sexual relationship with a man at all is with child. And that is just the way the Bible teaches it from beginning to end. We'll take this chronologically. Let's begin in Genesis chapter three 
and verse 15 where we get a hint right from the get-go that this conquering deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, would not be the offspring of a man. Here we get the first gospel promise, this first messianic prophecy in verse 15 where we're hearing about the consequences that have come because of the fall of Adam and Eve and the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, referring to Christ, shall bruise you on the head, that is a fatal blow to Satan, and you, Satan, shall bruise him on the heel, which of course takes us to the pain and agony of the cross. Notice that it says the seed of a woman. That is a strange way to speak. The Bible almost ref always refers to the seed of a man. To speak of the seed of the woman is, is interesting. That's strange language. But it is speaking of the distant offspring of Eve, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in this prophecy that the foundation is laid for a virgin conception. There's no mention, you'll note, of a father here. It is the seed of the woman. So this prophecy points us in the direction of a woman, and it is that very language that Paul employs in Galatians 4 when he speaks about Christ. He says, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Let's move to the prophets. Turn to Isaiah chapter 7. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, we read that in the reign of Ahaz, the king of Judah, that Isaiah announces a sign for the house of David. He gives a definitive prophecy that gives us some insight into the nature of Messiah's conception. Look at verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, don't miss that word. That's, he's, he's not just introducing some concept here. He's saying, think about it. Consider this. Behold, this is amazing. A virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel, which you know means God with us. So we've picked up a little bit more here. Of this woman is going to be born a child. She will be a virgin. The child will be a son and he will be called God with us. So this child will be both man and God. Now there's all kinds of discussion and debate about the meaning of the Hebrew word here for virgin. Some contend that it only means maiden or young girl, and we could spend the next, the next 10 minutes sort of tying ourselves up in linguistic knots, but it would be better, wouldn't it, just to let Scripture interpret Scripture. This messianic prophecy is quoted by Matthew in the New Testament. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. And verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother had been betrothed to Joseph, note these words, before they came together, that is before there was any intimate union between the man Joseph and his betrothed Mary, she, Mary, was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. 
And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away. He understood the deal, didn't he? He sees Mary and he's aware. And he wants to put her away because he knows there's only one way that this sort of thing happens. But he has a visit from an angel of the Lord, verse 20. When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus means, Jehovah saves. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, and here we have the quote from Isaiah, behold, the virgin will, shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now it's very important to note that when Matthew thinks about the text that Isaiah wrote, that prophecy given back in chapter 14, and he considered the word for virgin there, he did not say that it meant maiden, he did not say that it meant young woman. Matthew specifically uses a Greek word that is translated virgin, that's what it means. Matthew understood Isaiah to mean virgin, and his interpretation is infallible as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what he wrote. So don't tie yourself up in all sorts of academic doubt. My friend, if Isaiah says, I'm sorry, if Matthew says that Isaiah meant virgin, that is enough for us. Case closed. There is no ambiguity. Well, flip over to the book of Luke, the passage just in front of what we had read earlier for us this morning. Luke chapter one. And verse... Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Note this, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Why state it twice? Because the scriptures are emphatic and this is the same word that, that Matthew used back in his text, Parthenos, it means virgin, you can't miss it, it's stated twice. And as we read down, we engage this statement of the angel. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, here's our word again, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Note that, the Son of God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary, who understood just as Joseph understood, there's only one way for these kinds of things to, to come to be, says to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child should be called the Son of God. Mary, you're favored. And Mary, you're going to bear 
God's son. Mary, you're in this very privileged position, yes, but how will that be? Since I've never been with a man, I've never known a man, how is it even possible that I would, I would bear this child and the angel as if even to give Mary greater hope to strengthen her faith says in verse 36, he gives her another behold. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son, don't miss these words, in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Almost like it speaks of Sarah and Abraham, Elizabeth is barren, she's an old woman, she has no, there's no rational reason why this woman should be bearing a child and yet she was gonna bear the forerunner to the Messiah, John the Baptist. And here's the point, brothers and sisters, here is the point. Nothing, verse 37, will be impossible with God. And in an astonishing, when you consider the stake, statement of humility, Mary says, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. In fact, if you want to flip over to Luke chapter 3 and verse 23, we get another little bit of commentary on this. Just before the genealogy of Jesus given here, It says that when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Jesus was not the son of Joseph. He was the son of God. And as the offspring of Mary, he was the son of man. So scripture is abundantly clear, isn't it? Do you need more proof than what has been revealed in these passages? It's been consistent all the way through. That's what scripture teaches. The question is, why is it so important? And that brings us to our second point, the vital importance of the virgin conception. Do you see it as important? Do you understand it as important? Do you understand why? This is a doctrine, this is a hill to die on. This is a doctrine for which, as a believer, you must wage war. This is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. If you you pull on this thread, the whole sweater comes apart. Well, the vital importance of the virgin conception is noteworthy, really, for at least four reasons, and I'm just gonna give you four today. You give up the virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ and one, firstly, you give up the integrity of scripture. The integrity of scripture is compromised. That should be plain. As we've seen, the scripture claims in no uncertain terms, it is dogmatic about it. As, as Steve Lawson likes to say, it's bulldogmatic about it. There is Nothing here that would give you any other conclusion than that Jesus was born of a virgin. And so if we give up the virgin birth, then we have given up the Bible. The Bible cannot be trusted if it can't be trusted in all that it affirms. The accuracy of scripture is abandoned. The authority of scripture is undermined. Think about Matthew writing what he was writing. Why was he writing it? He was writing an account of the Lord Jesus Christ that the gospel, the good news, might go out to the known earth. Yes? Yes. Now, if you were an author and you were going to write a book to convince someone of the veracity of the claims of Jesus Christ, would you begin your book with a virgin birth. Matthew cannot get to the 18th verse of the first chapter before he begins to speak about this wild-eyed concept that the Son of God was actually conceived of a virgin. Listen, if Matthew is lying about that, what else is he lying about? 
You see, the Bible comes to us, doesn't it? And it reveals many things, lots of things, all kinds of things, page by page. Things that are beyond our comprehension, beyond our conception. And I don't know what else you would expect from a book that was written and whose ultimate author is God. To question the veracity of the Bible is to look God in the eye and say, no, no, it didn't happen that way. And to challenge the clear meaning of one text is to challenge the clear meaning of the entire Bible. You don't know where to stand. You give up the virgin birth, you give up the inerrancy of scripture. And I wanna say to you, dear friends, don't Jefferson the Bible. There's no reason to Jefferson the Bible. The Bible is true through and through and it is the ultimate demonstration of pride to handle the word of God that way that you the creature will sit above and beyond the creator like a human literary critic putting Shakespeare under, under the eye except multiply that by infinity. Who are you to question the testimony of God? Did you hear that in what was read today? The, the, the shepherds, it just struck me. After hearing the angel, the shepherds go straight to Bethlehem. Let us go straight there. Why? Let us see the thing that has happened that the Lord has made known to us. You see, they were listening to the revelation of God and saying, let's move on it. Down below, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. Listen, you do not want to be party with those who say, did God say? That was the arrogant sin of Satan himself. And to attack the truthfulness and trustworthiness of the Bible is foolish. And if you're going to cut out the miraculous, you are gonna cut away the only sure foundation that you have for life and salvation. Well, not only is the integrity of scripture compromised, but secondly, the grace of God is clouded. The grace of God is clouded. Here's what I mean. The Bible is clear that salvation is of the Lord. It is his doing. Man and his grimy fingers can have nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is God's doing from beginning to end. It is a divine accomplishment. It has nothing to do with human achievement whatsoever. And the virgin birth gives us insight to that. David himself, when he was fleeing Absalom, says salvation belongs to the Lord. Later on, as a host is camped against him, he says, my soul waits in silence for God only, for from him is my salvation. You'll remember Jonah, who was in the belly of a fish, in the closing line of his prayer, just before the Lord gave that great fish some epicac and forced him to vomit up Jonah, Jonah says, salvation is of the Lord. What other hope did Jonah have in the belly of a fish but that God himself would save him. You see, the supernatural means by which Jesus was conceived teaches us that salvation is by God's doing, it is by his grace, it is by his power, and it is quite apart from any human effort whatsoever. When we say that God saves, we do not mean that somehow God opened a way for salvation so that each one of us could sort of make our way along that path so that we could attain and climb the stairway, the ladder to heaven. We are not saying that God makes salvation possible, but that God and the Lord Jesus Christ himself is a savior who plunges in to our mess to rescue those who cannot rescue themselves. And that is completely apart from man's doing. 
Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, we know this, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. That's why, young people, if you're still sitting here and you wonder why do we give gifts at Christmas, understand this, that ultimately it's not so that you can have a nice new pair of shoes. It, it, it is, at least from a Christian's vantage point, an expression of the love of Christ and the love of God in sending Christ to sinners. Salvation is not a result of works and God has taken any and all boasting out of man for we are his workmanship. And you say, well, what does that have to do with the virgin birth? Well, simply this. You were stuck in sin, alienated from God, under wrath like all the rest, and how was it that you were going to find yourself reconciled to a God who is perfect, pure, and holy? How were you gonna fix the dilemma? You see, it takes God to fix the dilemma. And I was thinking this morning about the psalm that salvation is so expensive that you should cease trying forever to try and redeem yourself, which led me to another thought as I considered these things, that salvation, man, did it require a lot of work, a lot of ingenuity. There's all sorts of dilemmas about this that you and I would have never figured out. But God figured it out in his wisdom and God sent his son, and he sent his son as an infant. And he did it through a virgin conception. And you see, if you're jittery about the supernatural work of God and a virgin conception, then, then you have completely missed the point. The point is that it is God's doing. And if we reject that principle, if we neglect that, to see that, that God must do it, then we are going to neglect to see that all, even our own salvation is dependent upon a supernatural demonstration of God's power to, to change us, to give us a heart that might long for Christ and long to repent of our sin. You see, the virgin birth is supernatural. Your conversion is supernatural. The resurrection is supernatural. We must be okay with the supernatural. And it is humbling to come to a God who must do everything for our salvation. My son grew up and one of his first words was myself. He loved that. You go to tie his shoes and he would say myself, me self, me do, right? That was his thinking. When it comes to salvation, there is no me do, none. <laughs> There's no myself. Salvation is of the Lord and that is humbling. But I ask you this morning, have you ever asked the Lord to have mercy on you? Sinner here this morning under a burden of guilt and the weight of your sin, the conviction of it, that's the best place to be because Jesus came to save sinners and God never asked you to fix the problem. He just asked you to receive the gift, which is Christ Jesus, given, conceived of a virgin, born under the law, who lived the life you could not live, died a death in your place to receive the punishment you were due, and you receive that gift by faith. And he will give you life. He will cleanse your slate. He will receive you to himself, adopt you into his family. That is the good news of Christmas. Have you ever asked him? Well, there's a third point, a third thing that we give up. We find that if we give up the virgin conception that the nature of Christ is confused. And it's at this point, with 15 minutes left, that most people begin to go, man, this guy could really wrap this up. But I wanna say to you, this is gonna challenge you a little bit. I know we're swimming in deep waters, but hang with this. 
The nature of Christ is confused if we give up the virgin birth. You see, the Bible teaches that Jesus is both God and man. Not part God and part man, but fully God and fully man. And there is no blending of those two natures. He is two natures in one person. You're like, man, you already threw this virgin conception thing at me. Now you're going to throw two people in one. I know. It's a conception beyond conception. And when you take Jesus, if his deity is blue and his humanity is yellow, you do not get Jesus being green. You have one being with two distinct natures. He is both fully God and fully man. And beyond that, our salvation is dependent upon the fact that he is perfectly sinless. And all of that, at least in part, is directly related to and hangs upon the virgin conception. You see, there is a dilemma, as I've said, in saving sinners. And here's the dilemma. We all inherited a sin nature, didn't we? We inherited from our parents a nature, a bent, that is opposed to God, that is ultimately selfish, that turns away. When when, when you hear people talking about abolishing the police, defunding the police, all that kind of stuff, Understand what's behind that again. It is an assumption on the part of our culture that man is essentially good and if we just get rid of authority structures, everything would be fine. Everybody get along just swell. You can just think back to that old chop or whatever they called it there in Seattle to figure out that that is not the way things pan out. And while man shakes his fist at God saying we're fine without authority, we can do well on ourselves, God understands the reality of things. He knows that we have inherited a sin nature from our parents who inherited it from theirs all the way back to Adam. When Adam fell, we fell in him. He is our federal head, our representative head. And if, 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 if you're offended at my saying that about you, that somehow you have a bent towards rebellion and a bent towards self-serving and a bent toward, your, toward pride, uh, just receive the testimony of Scripture. Each of us begins under the judgment of God. Each of us begins, as I said earlier, as a ch- child of wrath, even as the rest. And if you can't receive it from me this morning or from the Bible itself saying that there are none righteous, not even one, many of you have been parents and that should be enough proof for you. (laughs) Right? Children know how to do sin without even being taught to do so. No parent ever had to teach their child how to throw a tantrum. No parent ever had to teach their child how to lie. No parent ever had to teach their child how to steal a toy that they wanted from some other kid. No child or no parent ever had to had to 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 teach his child how to rise up on their heels with a defiant no. Why is that? Why is it that you had to teach your children how to obey, but disobedience came very naturally to them? Rebellion, disrespect. You see, the problem is that we are, we are bent at the core. God created mankind good, but in sin, every one of us has been infected and impacted to such an extent that we can no longer see straight. It is the weirdest thing, isn't it, when you hear a kid almost in a knee-jerk response lie to you for the first time. You go, where did they get that? I know where they got it. So do you, from the father of lies. You see, and you can see the dilemma, can't you? Can't you see what's coming here? Every child is born infected with sin, their nature being impacted by sin, But we need someone who is sinless to atone for our sins. We need a man, even more than that, we need a perfect man who can 
who can step in and bear the penalty and the punishment that we are due. And so God demands a perfect sacrifice, a pure and unblemished lamb. And you can see that going all the way back again to the very earliest chapters of the Bible. And so if Jesus is going to atone for our sins, he cannot have a sin nature. He must be sinless. He must be spotless. And so the problem becomes obvious. How can Christ, who enters into the polluted stream of human life after the fall of Adam, how is he going to do that and yet escape our sin nature and our corruption? How is Jesus going to identify with a sin-stained humanity without becoming stained himself? And the, the answer to that vital question is the virgin conception. Flip back, I think you're still there. Look at the book of Luke in verse 35. Verse 35. Here the angel drops the bomb on Mary. And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Spirit of God comes in the power of God. Now look at these words. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. You see, it is because the Holy Spirit in the power of God brings about the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary that that child will be called what? Holy and the Son of God. Somehow, and there is, as I've said, mystery in all of this, Jesus in his human nature is sanctified, set apart, separated for sin, separated for the work that the Father had sent him to accomplish as the sin bearer. In other words, not only does the Holy Spirit perform a physical miracle in bringing a living child into a womb apart from the seed of a man, but there is also, if you will, a spiritual miracle in that the Holy Spirit sanctifies or sets apart the human nature of Christ from its very inception and keeps it free from the pollution of sin. Now it has been taught, as long as I've been alive, I know that somehow the problem was Joseph's. That Joseph is the one, as the man, who contributes the sin of uh, a sinful human nature. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And really it is an assumption I think that was founded because obviously Joseph makes no contribution here. I think it is better to look at this and simply say that the Holy Spirit preserved a sinless human nature so that Jesus might be the perfect human son. So the virgin birth, it is through that that, the, that Jesus was spared from an inherited corruption that translates somehow through natural human means. And this enabled the Lord to live a righteous life and to provide a sinless, unblemished sacrifice as the Lamb of God. So the sinlessness of Christ and his human nature is tied up in the virgin birth. But there's another reason the virgin conception was necessary, and I stated it earlier, that Jesus had to be both God and man. First Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. So if Jesus is to save sinners, he must be both God and man. And there have to be two distinct natures, one divine and one human in one person. And as infinite God, Jesus provides a sacrifice of infinite worth. You understand that? If Jesus were just a man, even if he were a perfect man, and he were a perfect man who was to give his life for the sin of another, how many people could he redeem? One, that's right. If it were man for man, he could redeem an individual, assuming he were perfect, 
Assuming he had attained to the standard of heaven, which is perfection, and nobody is perfect except Jesus, Jesus could have saved his own neck or he could have given his life for somebody else. But as God, Jesus provides a sacrifice of infinite worth to bear the full penalty for all the sins of all of the men, women, and children who would place their faith in him as their substitute. That's why he had to be God, among other reasons. But he also had to be man. He had to be fully human. He had to actively live a life of obedience that God required of Adam, and Adam failed. But that's why Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. Adam failed, but Jesus comes to fulfill all that Adam failed to fulfill. And so Jesus, just as Adam was our, 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 our federal head to lead us into sin, so Jesus becomes our representative and our federal head to lead all who would hope in him into heaven. It's a drag to get pulled down into sin through Adam, but it's a glory to get pulled to heaven on the coattails of Jesus, isn't it? You see, Jesus is the perfect God-man, and he rendered obedience as a human being, though he was tempted in all things as we are, what? Without sin. And then beyond that, he was able to stand as our substitute to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice imputing his righteousness to us and our sin to himself. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Why is it then that a sinless Christ would have to die on a cross? And the answer to that question is because your sin and mine was imputed to him. He bore the infinite wrath of God as the perfect God-man, as the Lamb that he might take on himself our sins and offer himself as a perfect sacrifice. You see, the virgin conception made all that possible. Listen to Wayne Grudem. He writes, quote, God in his wisdom ordained a combination of human and divine influence in the birth of Christ so that his full humanity would be evident to us from the fact of his ordinary human birth from a human mother, and his full deity would be evident from the fact of his conception in Mary's womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that very thing is reflected for us, isn't it, in Isaiah 9, 6, when it says that for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. That verse, that messianic prophecy again, is saying more than there would simply be a child who would be a male. Listen to it again, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. He was a son before he was a son. He was the son of God eternally and forever, long before he ever became a son of man. You see, the eternal son of God was given to a world to bear their sins. You know, first, or you know John three sixteen. for God so loved, or in this way loved, the world that he gave his only unique son, that those believing in his name, what, should not perish but have everlasting life. And how is this son going to, to come to us? Well, we're told a child will be born, just a human child. At least it appeared that way from the outside. Jesus is both son of God and son of man and he fully bridges the gap that exists between you and the God with whom you have to do, the perfect and holy God with whom you have to do. It is an account of his perfect deity and his perfect humanity, his all-sufficient deity, his righteousness in his humanity that Christ is able to bridge that gap. So here's the point. 
The virgin conception guards both the deity and the humanity of Christ and the virgin conception maintains the sinlessness of Christ. Those things need to be clear in your head because that is the nature of Christ. Again, we're swimming in deep waters, I get it. And this is a conception beyond conception, but we do well to think about these things at length. Well, we give up the virgin conception and A, the integrity of scripture is compromised, the grace of God is clouded, the nature of Christ is confused, and finally the end of sinners is condemnation. You give up the virgin birth, you give up salvation. Jesus was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. If not, he is not God, and if he is not God, he cannot save. Brothers and sisters, your eternal salvation hinges on this doctrine. Like I said, it is a fundamental, essential doctrine of the Christian faith. And if Jesus Christ is not born to a virgin, if he simply is a mere human born through natural conception, he has no capacity and no power to save. One author put it very succinctly. The virgin birth is an underlying assumption in everything the Bible says about Jesus. There is no issue that is more important than the virgin birth and understanding who Jesus is. If Jesus was simply the illegitimate child of Mary's infidelity, or if the child of Joseph's natural union with Mary, or marital union with Mary, then he is not God. And if he is not God, his claims to be God are lies. And if his claims are lies, his salvation is a hoax. And if this salvation is a hoax, we're all doomed. You see, this, this really, if you think about it, is the Christmas parallel to Paul's reasoning at Easter. Do you remember what he said about the resurrection? He said, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you're still in your sins. So in the incarnation, if Christ is not born of a virgin, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. In other words, if you deny the virgin birth, you deny that Jesus is God, and you deny the very essence of Christianity. Listen, here's the good news. You ready? Here's the good news. Thomas Jefferson was wrong. That is the good news. The good news is that Jesus, in fact, was born of a virgin, that he is, in fact, infinite God and sinless men, the only mediator between God and man. And my question to you, brother, sister, young and old in here today, is have you received this son as your Savior and as your Lord? There is no salvation apart from him. The Bible is crystal clear about that. And I would say to you, brothers and sisters who have received him, rejoice that he is the savior of sinners. Let that stir you all Christmas long. Don't sit there in a funk because of your failings. Rejoice. Be glad. May your heart be lifted because Christ has redeemed you from sin. I love the lyrics when the great hymn says, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And from the cradle to the cross, he came in order to redeem you for himself. That is the very purpose of his coming and he is not a reluctant savior. He is not a reluctant savior. He is not begrudging. Rejoice and be glad. Wasn't that the announcement of the angel? Joy to the world. To those of you who don't know Christ, I call you even this morning yet again to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him, be wise, seek him, seek the salvation that is offered in the Son. Christmas is God's gift to you. Christmas is God's gift to you. That child in the womb, that child who is born is a son who was given to bear your sins. His name is Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. Even in his name it's tied up, all of his purpose don't reject him. 
There is salvation in no other name, and if the virgin birth would convey any to, anything to you, my unbelieving friend, it should tell you this, that God is compassionate and full of mercy. He looked down from heaven on your plight and the judgment that will undoubtedly come to all who refuse Christ. And he gave his only begotten son, that unique son, born of a virgin, and you should see that this God is a God of love who went to great lengths to provide salvation for all who will receive it. Listen to John 1, 1, 12. As many as received him. As many as received him. To them he gave the right to become the children of God even to those who believe in his name. Let's pray as Daryl comes forward. Our Father, what can we say again but thank you? You are wise and you are good. Lord, you are compassionate and full of mercy. And you have looked on the sons of men knowing that they rightfully, each one of us rightfully, deserved your wrath and strict justice. Lord, you are holy, 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 and no man can approach you except the Lord Jesus Christ and it's in him that we find our righteousness and it's in him that we see our sins are forgiven and it's in him that there is a salvation offered to all who will simply look to Christ in faith and repentance. And I pray this morning that you might open the heart of some. And Lord, that you might be honored and glorified in saving them. I pray, Father, today that as we go from this place, that our hearts will be full of gratitude, that we again will be stunned at this conception beyond conception, that we would worship you and honor you. You are the great God of Christmas, the great God, the great giver, the one who has given himself, that we might be with you forever and ever and know the richest of blessings. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time to to contemplate your word. I pray that you would bless it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing once more. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. God bless you. Have a great and worshipful Christmas.